Hello, Hello church. church. Hello, Hello church. church. Hello, 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 church. An old preacher was invited to an anniversary celebration of a church. He had been the pastor there many decades before. He attends on that day, and as he's waiting for his turn to preach, the offering is taken. The ushers bring the various offering plates from each aisle up to the Lord's Supper table, and the first one sets his on the, the Lord's Supper table. The next one pours the contents of his offering plate into the first one. The next one pours his in, and one other pours his in. And then they put all the empty offering plates on top of the one that's full. It's quite a little ordeal and watch them do that. Then they make their way back to their own seats. Well, when it's time for this old preacher to get up and speak at this anniversary celebration, first thing he does is ask a question. Do you ushers know why you do that with the offering? when you come up to the front. And of course, the only response is that, well, that's how we've always done it. And he said, let me tell you why you do it that way. When I was pastor here uh, decades ago, we had no air conditioning. We had all the windows open. The summertime, the breeze would blow through here. And if we didn't do the offering plates just like you did, then those $100 bills and $5 bills would be flying all over the sanctuary. We'd hear the noise uh, 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 of uh, people scrambling to grab that money and put it back where it goes. He said, but today you have air conditioning. This is a very nice sanctuary. It's very modern. All you have to do is walk up to this Lord's Supper table and set the plate down it's not going to blow away. Well, we do things because that's how it needed to be, be done in years past. Now let's look at a passage of scripture today. It's the Gospel of Mark chapter two, verses 18 down to 22. Uh, again, it's one of those instances when Jesus is butting heads with the religious leaders. So let me read that passage of scripture to you. Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, While the groom is with them, the attendants of the groom cannot fast, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the groom is taken away from them, and then they shall fast on that day. And then verse 21 says, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it. The new from the old, and the worse tear results. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost and the skin as well. But one puts new wine in fresh wineskins. The first couple of verses are talking about fasting. It was another one of uh, the Pharisees' interpretation uh, of the law but it was an interpretation and a practice that they did that the common people, sinners in their mind, did not follow. Jewish tra tradition required one day a year for fasting. That was the Day of Atonement. Well, Jesus was having this conflict with the religious leaders, and here it is. This time it's fasting. It's always going to be something that they are irritated about that Jesus does or says. 
Fasting is basically going without food for a particular time for a spiritual or religious purpose. Uh, more modern times, fasting has been found to have health benefits. The Jews would fast as a result of personal loss, as an expression of repentance, even as a preparation for prayer. As I said, the law of Moses only required one day a year for, for fasting. On that day of atonement, it was a, a, a holy convocation according to the book of Leviticus. Well, after the Babylonian exile, they added some more days, four other fast days. Zechariah tells us about those. But by the time of Jesus, those Pharisees were fasting not one time a year, not uh, five times a year, but two times every week. Every week, twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. Those were fast days. They were generally about 12 hours, sun up to sundown. Of course, that would vary with the seasons. The Pharisees also made sure that people knew how spiritual they were by showing everyone that they were fasting. Well, Jesus was not opposed to fasting. He was opposed to how it was generally practiced. Let me give you his take on it from the Gospel of Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18. Now, whenever you fast, and I could translate that as, in case you fast, do not make a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they distort their faces so that they will be noticed by the people when they are fasting. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But as for you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by people, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In the 13th chapter of Acts, the first few verses, we see that the first century church, uh, primarily Gentiles, fasted. We read that they were serving the Lord and fasting. Well, Jesus gives three parables to answer the question that's been asked by him. Why don't your disciples fast? You see, following a bunch of rituals, religious rituals, is not easy. It takes a lot of effort. And the critics of Jesus and the critics of his disciples are saying, hey, looks like you guys are just taking it easy. You're trying to do religion the easy way. Looks like you're putting out no effort to be a religious person. The critics were concerned that Jesus had no respect for traditions. Well, the first parable is that of a wedding feast. It talks about just the groom, but it is the entire wedding feast. That's a joyful occasion, a celebration. Could be a week long in their, the way that they would do it. Fasting definitely would not be a part of the celebration. In fact, there was a, a rabbi rule that you don't fast during a wedding feast. Well, fasting was associated with sorrow, with repentance. Fasting involved grief over personal sin, and that's good. But a wedding was a time of joy, new life, new beginning. So Jesus is telling them, while he was there, there's no need to fast. He was the groom and the disciples are the, it doesn't matter about gender, but the disciples are the bridegroom and uh, anyone else involved in the wedding celebration. Jesus is there. Now he said it might be appropriate after his death and resurrection but it wasn't necessary while he was walking on this earth and physically with his people. The lesson here is that the way to the Lord is not religious activity. Many people believe that, they still believe it today. That's the mainstay of most cults. Uh, religious activity 
and they feel that it gets them close to God in some way. Well, there's religious activity that we can do that gets us close to God. But as far as gaining favor, no. The way to the Lord is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, as he said. He is the truth. He is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Verses 21 and uh, 22 here uh, are talking about something new that's happening. Something that's incompatible with even what John the Baptist was doing. It's a message of salvation. Something new was happening. The old brittle wine skins would not be able to contain it. So parables two and three are similar to each other. First one is a wedding feast and the next two are, are actually teaching uh, the same lesson. So much of the new life in Christ just didn't match up with what the Jewish people were doing. Now, Jesus said you wouldn't take a, a piece of new cloth and patch an old garment. New unshrunk cloth, you wouldn't use that. Because that new patch, the very first time you washed that new, that uh, old repaired garment, very first time you washed it, then that patch is going to shrink and it's going to tear, it's going to pull away and tearing and it's going to add more damage than before you even tried to repair that garment. In fact, the garment is probably useless now. It's ruined. And he said you would not put fresh grape juice in an old wine skin. In those days, they used goat skin to make a container for their wine, for their juice. Fresh grape juice would ferment while it was in that wine, that, uh, wine skin. And as it fermented, it would expand. An old wine skin would no longer be flexible. The expanding juice would burst it. That container would now be useless. Just like the old garments ruined by using the wrong patch, the juice and the container are both lost. So what's the lesson here? Jesus brings a newness that cannot be confined within the old forms of religion. Tradition cannot be put on the same level as scripture unless that activity, that religious activity is based on scripture. And we have a lot of that. But there's also a lot that goes on that has nothing to do with God's word. And not just tradition, our personal preferences often get in the way of what Jesus wants us to do. We often place our personal preferences above God's word. So even though both Jewish and Gentile Christians observed fasting, it was never at the level of what the Pharisees were doing. Alan Cole, in response to the new wine and old wine skins, writes this, whenever the fresh life of the spirit breathes in the church, the same problem arises. The church seeks appropriate forms in which to contain and express this new life. Well, we need to discern how much of the old to discard. We need to know how much of the old should be left behind. Doesn't mean the old was wrong. Doesn't necessarily mean the old was sinful. It may just mean we don't need that anymore. We don't need to do it like that anymore. Like the ushers pouring all the money into one plate and covering it up with empty plates so it doesn't blow away. They don't need to do that anymore. You see, the old may not have been evil, but it's time has passed. I always enjoyed going through a Rand McNally road atlas. We always had a great big one and had every state in the United States. It would also have some uh, smaller maps 
of larger cities, a little bit more detail for those cities. But nowadays, most of the time when I need a map, I go to my iPhone map. Now, was my Rand McNally evil? Was that sinful? Was that wrong? No. That's the way we had to do it a few years ago. Now we have a better way. And these electronic methods of mapping and finding directions. Uh, my iPhone will tell me if there's an accident ahead, it'll tell me how long it will take until I get to my destination. It'll give me some uh, alternative routes. If I make a wrong turn, it will correct itself. Now, it might not be not nice in the way that it comes back and says, I made a wrong turn, but it will make some corrections and we will eventually get to our destination. Well, the changing from the Jewish religion to a new relationship with Jesus Christ, well, that took some learning. And the disciples even were very slow in learning that lesson. I believe a lot of people today are still slow in learning the lesson of what in our life needs to be behind us and what is before us in our walk with Christ. Some of the best examples I see of drastic change in people are those who have uh, uh, gotten over a, a drug addiction. And I've seen so many testimonies, heard them live here in our own church from Teen Challenge in that ministry. And they'll show some before and after pictures. And some of those uh, um, men, and it's Teen Challenge, but most of them are, are adults. But some of those men, some of those uh, uh, young ladies, they're awful looking when they're under the influence of those drugs. And then after they get out of that, I get off of it, they're healthy, they have Christ in their heart. Those guys and girls are pretty nice looking. And they're well spoken. They have a whole new outlook on life. Did they keep part of the drugs? Did they keep, no, no. It all had to go away so they could have the new life. Let me give you another example about resisting change because not everyone makes that change. A book a few years ago is called Simple Church. It's been uh, updated recently to uh, relate to COVID. But in that, uh, that book uh, back several years ago, there was a study of 600,000 heart patients. And all the patients were told to do just a very few simple things so they could live a long life. Those simple things are change your diet, quit smoking, quit drinking alcoholic beverages, exercise, and reduce your stress. And that's all. That's all. And if the patients made the decisions to change in those areas, they would live. Sometimes the old has to be discarded. And sometimes that old is really bad. I mentioned earlier some things, they were just older ways of doing things. But I'm talking about now in this illustration, some bad things that needed to have been gone out of person's life, discarded. So what if those 600,000 people chose not to make the changes? Well, they would die. Now here's what the results of that research found, and it's very sad. 90% of those people chose not to make the, the changes in their lives. 90% said, no, I'm gonna keep on eating what I was eating, keep on smoking, keep on drinking, don't really need to exercise, not much I can do about stress. Basically, they were choosing to die. 2014, I faced that same kind of decision. Quadruple bypass surgery on my heart. 
And I remember my surgeon, I had about a week from the time it was diagnosed and the, the surgery scheduled and uh, waiting for a week. But I remember my surgeon said, you know, told me those simple things as well to do. Now, uh, I didn't have to stop doing all of that because uh, I've never smoked. I think I had, uh, I've had one glass of alcoholic wine in my entire life and it was homemade wine and uh, kind of a novelty. So the drinking and the smoking, I didn't have to stop those. But I did need to change um, my diet. I did need to exercise more. I was already exercising. It was just becoming less effective uh, because of the need for the quadruple bypass. Anyway, my, my, my surgeon said, most of my patients do not make any changes after the surgery and they don't last long after that. And I told her I'm going to make those changes and I have and I, and I did. COVID has affected a couple of those areas, uh, restricted uh, exercise in this last year and increased the stress levels. But hopefully I get back over that just shortly before COVID started, I did a marathon. I hope to do another one this uh, next spring. During that week between the schedule, the diagnosis, and then the scheduled surgery, a pastor friend called me, called to pray for me, encourage me. And he said, that bypass, uh, that's not such a big deal. He said, I've had it twice. And I'm trying to think, how do I ask him, why do you have it twice? My surgeon said, if you make lifestyle changes, this is going to fix you. In fact, she said I would be fixed for the rest of my life and, and live for possibly many decades. But I go ahead and get up the nerve and ask him. I said, Pastor, why did you have to have it twice? He had a quick answer. He said, I didn't change my lifestyle. I still ate what I wanted to eat. I didn't exercise. Um, he is not alive today. We also need to make those same kind of changes about our spiritual lives, don't we? We need to live eternally. And Jesus says, you need to make some changes. Don't hang on to that, uh, that old way, that uh, old garment, that old wine skin. You need the new. It's interesting to note in the second and the third parables that something is destroyed. God does not just mend our hearts. He gives us a brand new heart. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 says, Moreover, I give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That sounds like something out of the New Testament, but it's from the prophet Ezekiel. God gives us a new nature and we are new creatures in Christ. To try to put this kind of life into an old legalistic system, well, that will destroy the new life. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, anyone be in Christ. He is a new, a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. After I finish in a moment, watch a video, just an inspirational video about the new creation. But I want to close with a, uh, a benediction. I want to encourage you before I read this benediction. It's a uh, a blessing, but it's from uh, the book of Ephesians, the hand of Paul. I want to encourage you if you need to make that change from the old to the new, from an old way of life that's not a good way of life into the better way of life that Christ offers, please go to our website, centralalameda.org. Please click on the connect button and connect with me. I would love to hear from you. I will respond to you and help you in your walk with Christ, whether it's beginning the walk or continuing in the walk with Christ. And let me give you 
a, a benediction, a, a blessing as we close, and then hang on and watch the, the short video. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.